if you're not sure what I just did, it might help you to learn a little bit about what's called the cage system. So what I just did is I played an A and B flat chord in five different ways across the neck. So harmonically, what was happening there was pretty much the same thing every time. The idea of the cage system is that there's five ways to do everything. And you might think, is this is some kind of innovative system that somebody came up with? It's really just the logic of how the fretboard is laid out when we play in what we call standard tuning. So let me show you step-by-step step what this so-called cage system is, and then we'll apply it to a very, very important Spanish guitar progression. We're gonna take a C chord, okay? And we're gonna free up our index finger and that's going to allow us to move the chord around okay so there's a C chord kind of weird to play it that way we're going to move it up one fret and then bar the first fret so what we've done is we've reproduced a C chord up one fret and we can move it anywhere and you might as you try to do this you might think well that's pretty hard to do and it is it's not we don't play this one super often um, but what we really need this for is that we can play or we can recognize and identify little fragments of it and go oh look that's an E flat major chord so if you know a C chord Hopefully you know that that is a C note, and you don't really need to know a lot about music theory for this, and that's the great thing about it. We just need to know what the root of the chord is. So the reason that this is called a C chord, it's a major chord, a happy sounding chord. All we really need to know is that this is C. So if I moved this up, we moved everything up the same amount. So everything is exactly intact as it was before. So now this is a C sharp note or a D flat note, we could call it. So this is a D flat major chord. It's as simple as that. So if you want to play an F chord, my pinky's on F here. We can always play a more manageable fragment of it. Absolutely. But we just need to be imagining our fingers or the kind of dot pattern of it so that we know how to name the chord. Okay, so that is the C form. Now the next one's A. Got an A chord like this. Let's free up the index finger. All right, move it up one fret. I'm just saying one fret just to show you how similar these shapes are, I mean, they're literally the same picture. So we're really just moving pictures around and that's what's so great about the guitar. I mean, if you tell this to a piano player, the cage system, that, that means nothing to people who don't know the guitar, okay? This is like a guitar specific idea. So if this is A, this must be B flat, and this is the thing we actually do in a lot of Spanish guitar, right? Although we simplify it and play it like this, right? Because it's kind of hard to do this, okay? So this is a B flat note, so this means that's B flat major. So if I went to an E note, for example, there's E, and then I'm just going to reproduce the shape of an A chord. There it is, that is an E major chord now. And if that's true, couldn't I play the low E string with it? Okay, now we're getting somewhere where we're kind of seeing these connections, hopefully. Next one is G, here's a G chord. We're gonna play it like this. Remember, we're freeing up our index finger in every case here, only so that we can make it movable. Okay, if this is G, let's move it up one fret. That would be A flat probably, or G sharp, and then I'm barring the first fret. That is A flat, here's A. You may have seen this before, Super common to see that in classical guitar, all kinds of stuff, where I'm using the shape of G, right? It's an A chord though, because the root is A now, rather than G. And I'm using the open string because that's that note. I don't need to play that note when I can play it open here. So that is a perfect example of kind of an amalgam of two different shapes. I'm over here in the A form, the A form of A. I like to call it uh, A in its natural habitat, the A form, and then mixing it up there, just like we did here on the A form of E with the low E string. For that matter, I don't have to bar it at all because E is the root of the chord. So we can take advantage of open strings that way and kind of blend these things together. Next one is E. So here's an E chord. Getting rid of our index finger so we can make it move. Well, this one you probably have done already. And in flamenco or Spanish guitar, we do this a lot. Taking that bar off makes it sound a little more mysterious, but that's the shape, the E form, right? This is a C note. E, F, G, A, B, C. I'm reproducing the picture of an E chord, and it's a C chord. If I went backwards to the left, this would be the G form of C. Keep going, now here's another C note. There's the A form of C. That's what I was kind of doing at the beginning here. They're all the same thing, and then I end up on C here. Last one is the D form. There's a D chord, D major chord, get rid of your index. And now we're going to scoot it up one fret, but we have to account for the open strings, right? Now a D chord is kind of the, the wimpiest of all of our chords, right? It's only four strings here. And now it's movable, move it up one fret. There's an E flat chord. Here's an E chord. Here's an F chord. You wanna play some Spanish sounding thing? E, F, E, F, E, F, like we do this. Even when you do this the simple way, that's still called the E form always do fragments of it. E, F, E, F, E, F. 
For that deform, we can do something. It is kind of hard to do these. I mean, this is there's no accident that the ones you may be most familiar with is the E form and the A form. But for this deform, it's not the easiest thing in the world, right? If you know Sweet Child of Mine from Guns N' Roses, he is playing off of that D shape right there. But it's hard to play. You won't see it in a song very often, right? But what you will see, certainly in uh, some Spanish guitar stuff, is this inversion of it, like that. It's actually pretty easy to play that way. So what we're doing, if you've ever seen anybody play D like this, and usually on a steel string or an electric guitar, the neck is narrower, the strings are closer together, so it's not such a violation to come over here and play a low string. Um, but we can do that on a nylon string as well. But when you play D like this and then play F sharp in the bass, we are doing an inversion, we could call it. That's when the root is not the lowest note. But this note, F sharp, is already here. So we can just kind of flip it over to this. And now, and you certainly see that in flamenco a lot when you have something like this. That chord is gonna wanna go to G probably. It's a way of playing a D chord. So what I did here was, here's the movable way of playing the D form. This note, which is the third in the chord, anything that's on the first string is the same exact note two octaves below on this string, right? If you're on the same fret. So I'm taking this note and just flipping it down here. I'm just eliminating the first string. And now I have an inversion with the third on the bottom. So if this were an A chord, this is an A note, this is an A major chord, we would call this don't worry about what this name is. We just need to know, okay, that's the chord I want. I need to find an A note on the D string. So this is an A major chord using the D form. And now I'm doing this. A over C sharp would be the full name of this, but you don't really need to know that. As long as you can see this, we always can do that. The great thing about this is we don't want to hear the fifth string or the first string, but you are blocking those without even trying. I mean, I guarantee it. So my pinky is touching the first string. I don't want to hear that one. And my middle finger is blocking the fifth string. So that's not a problem. Now I can hit all of the strings. So that is an awesome chord. So that's where the cage system kind of really helps. You can just see the shape, modify it for this easier way. It's way easier to play, a really cool shape. Let's apply that real quick so I can show you how cool it is. Let's play a G chord and then go to a C chord, right? That's uh, from the one to the four if we were in the key of G major. But I'm gonna play G like this. Then I'm gonna jump up here to G over B and then go to C. You hear how that kind of leads into the next chord? Really cool. But we're getting ahead of ourselves a little bit because I wanna show you how you can connect all these together. And that really is the task, is once you get the idea of what caged is, like all five of those shapes are movable, we wanna get good at connecting them together. And you can really do it without a guitar. You can just write out on a piece of paper, six lines, get some frets in there, those are gonna be vertical lines, and then just connect the dots. I'll show you how to do that in a second. So like I said, it's significant that we're using the word caged because the spelling of that word is how they're connected on the neck. So let's take the C form, move it up one fret, and we have D flat major. Let's play a D flat major chord all over the neck, connecting them in order. So we have the C form of D flat. Wherever you have the C form, your pinky is the root, put your first finger there. So there's the A form, there it is. So this is another thing to remember. The C form and the A form both have their root on the fifth string. Now there's another root in there, an octave higher, but I think when you're first learning this, don't think about that. It's the low root that matters, okay? So the A form and the C form are fifth string root chords. So let's go back to this. There's the C form of D flat, and we just kind of connect. That's your connection point. That's a landmark we want to have in our head. Okay, every time that you see the A form, we know that the G form is next because of the spelling of the word cage, right? So these three in a row become what you bar here with this finger. So that's our connection point to get to the G form. And sure enough, the root, go back to G, is on the sixth string, right? Well, when I do this here, we can kind of double check. What note is that? Oh, it is D flat. So it's kind of a way of getting the note that you wanted. Um, as long as you connect these patterns together, you will arrive at the right note. So here's D flat again, C form, D flat, A form, jump over to this connection point, these three and we have D flat using the G form. The same idea as before, we're going to connect this note, just like we did from the C form to the A form, where this is gonna get us to the E form, okay? So the G form and the E form both have the sixth string as their root, so that's a significant thing. So there's the G form, this is the D flat chord. Okay, put your first finger there and produce the picture of an open E in there. This whole time, we're really just playing the same chord. You can hear it. it's the same thing. And there's E. So whenever you have a full E form like this, your pinky is playing the octave of the root, okay? And that's our connection point. 
put your first finger there, and there's the D form. You can hear it's the same three notes of a major triad. Here we go. We can do our flipped over, more easy inversion here. And then come back. So you're not going to probably be playing a D flat major chord that often, but it's a great practice. And the chords that are more common, like a, an actual C chord, here's the A form of C, will be a little bit easier to see, I think. I always like to do things in weird places because it just makes it, it's a little harder mentally, but it just makes those more common ones more recognizable. So, so far we've been talking about only major chords. Now let's make them minor and we're gonna run into a problem here. So like I mentioned earlier, you've probably seen this, that's minor and this is major, because these, there's only one note we have to change to make it minor, but there's a couple of these cage forms where it's gonna get a little more problematic and we're gonna lose some strings. But here's the E form. I'm just choosing the fifth fret to play. It doesn't matter where we're doing it. Take this finger off and we have E minor. I'm, you may already know that. And just remember that it's coming from E major and E minor, the relationship there pertains up here. So sometimes people don't recognize that. Like you may have been playing that minor chord your whole life and never realize that, oh, it's just open E moved up to here. So of course it's an A minor chord because I moved what was an E minor chord. E being the root up to where that note is now an A and reproduce that picture. Okay, so we got the A form, make it minor. That's a minor chord. The tricky thing here, if you're first learning this, is this looks a lot like the E form, right? And you may have recognized that when they're open. Like an E major and an A minor are the same exact fingering, but it really matters what strings your fingers are on because there's one string that's tuned differently on the guitar than the others, and that means that the same exact shape produces, in this case, a minor chord where it would have been major if we didn't have that difference. You know when you tune the guitar and you go fifth fret, fifth fret, fifth fret, and then fourth fret, the one string is different on the guitar. Now we have the D form. This one's a little bit harder. There we go. But like I said, we can always fragment this. And so this is just a D minor chord, which you may know, and you can move it around. Here's this Weezer song that uses that. Songs like that can be really great for practicing your cage. We have an E minor chord. How do we know it's E minor? It's a D minor chord moved up two frets. Well, the distance from D to E is two frets, so if you move a D minor chord up two frets, it must be E minor, but let's test it out. Here's D minor freeing up the index finger so we can make it movable. Move it up one fret, that's E flat or D sharp. Now it's, e, yeah, there it is, there's E. But when I play this more manageable fragment of it, we're not playing that note anymore. It doesn't matter. This is still E minor. Here's the root again. So when you get more comfortable with this stuff, you'll start to notice the root that's higher as well. And that helps us break it up into little pieces also. So this is an E minor chord. A minor is the next one. Which shape do you think that's coming from? Two answers. When you use this finger, it could be ambiguous. If I use my pinky, it might be less ambiguous. That's the G form, okay, which we're going to talk about in a second. And it's part also of the E form. So it depends what finger you use, which shape we might conceive of that we're using at that moment. So we have E minor, A minor, D as we normally see it, and then G major as, do you recognize that? It's the E form, but just a little piece of it. So I am imagining right now the whole shape and I'm just plucking out this piece of it. It's so crazy how to make something easier, we're gonna just break it up into little pieces, which we should do and practice that. But all of a sudden it becomes completely unfamiliar and unrecognizable from the harder thing to do. So like I said, you can do it in your mind. If you can't sleep at night, you can think of these patterns and just kind of break them up into pieces. I think that's really important. Okay, you notice how I didn't go in order for the minors. I didn't go C, A, G, E, D. That's because the G and the C, there's a problem here. So we have an A minor using the E form. This is D as a D note. This is D minor using the A form, or the A minor form if you want to be totally thorough. And this is a G minor chord using the D minor form. Now let's look what happens to the C chord. Now if you play a C open C chord, the note that we need to change is actually happening twice here. And um, just a quick detour, what makes a chord major or minor is called a third. A major third sounds like this. It's two whole steps from the root. When you flat it, it's called a minor third. And it's that note that makes a chord major or minor. So that's why when we play this, we just take a note off. We're flatting a note by doing that. We're really not removing a note. We're making this note flat, but it's in the bar, so it's easy to think that we're taking something away. We're just changing something, the same number of notes, right? So if E is the major third in a C chord, we also have open E. Well, we can't flat both of those because that open E is out of range. So if I play the shape like this, playing the C form major, this is the third, and I'm also barring the third. How can I flat both of those 
I can't and still have everything else intact. We end up losing the first string and look how weird this is. That's a hard one, so that's why you haven't seen this very often, right? But you will see pieces of it. Let's go to a D minor chord. Here's D minor. Take this F on top and just move it down an octave to here. This is the same three notes, and we can see how the C form minor is emerging there. We're just playing a piece of it. But this is exactly the same as that. So this, all the stuff fits together like a puzzle. It's pretty interesting, and I think it's really great for our learning. You might think, well, who cares about this? I'm just gonna read the tab. But if you get comfortable with this, you'll start to recognize these shapes in that tab, and things won't seem like random numbers anymore. You can put them into a mental context, and your fingers will more readily go right to them, and you're gonna learn the song faster, memorize it more quickly, and you'll know it for longer. You won't forget it. It won't be random notes. It actually will have a context of these shapes that you know. Next is the G form. Let's see if that has the same problem. I already said that it did, right? So we have the third is represented twice. To flat that messes us up. We can always play fragments. In fact, fragments are better anyway. So let's see what happens. So we, when we play in major, this note needs to get flatted. Okay, everything else is the same. Here's that major third. We can't play that anymore because it had to be flatted. So we lost two strings there. But you may have seen this shape before. Many songs for Spanish guitar will end on this, because instead of playing this chord, which has a root and a fifth, which has a little more, almost a power chord rock sound to it, this is a little more clear that it's a minor chord. And that's a chord in what we call root position. We have the root, third, fifth, all nice and neat, stacked up like that. And there's the root again. So now that we kind of have an idea of what caged is, let's take the Andalusian Cadence, one of the best and most important Spanish guitar chord progressions, and see if we can apply all of our cage forms to that. So the Andalusian Cadence would be something like this, A minor, G, F to E. If I did those all with the E form, we would have A minor, G, everything is an E form here, right? So the idea with the Andalusian Cadence is we have a minor chord, go two frets to the left, a major chord, two more frets to the left, major, one fret, major, that's a Phrygian harmonic minor Spanish-y sounding thing. Um, let's see if we can do that for all of our chords, but not open chords, movable. Okay, we're gonna start on the first fret for all of them. So we start with a C form, right? This is gonna be the lowest chord of our Andalusian cadence. So we're gonna go in reverse, watch. Just did that in E, let's do that here with a D flat. That's a major chord, go up one fret. Now we got a D chord, up two frets. Up two more frets, but we have to make it minor, so we're gonna have to do that. There's our Andalusian cadence. Pretty tricky, but this is an exercise for seeing this stuff. Let's do it for the A form. Here's a B flat chord, up one fret, major, two more frets major, up two frets minor, there it is. Do it for the E form. I did it earlier open. We're going to start on F here. B flat, right? So once you can see these clearly, you can just go. Okay, now the D form. We have major chord, up a fret, two frets, up two frets again and make it minor. This is a great technique exercise too. I love it when we can combine technique and music theory. You can really kill two birds with one stone that way. Let's arpeggiate it. Okay, finally is the G form. This way we're getting mostly majors, which are easier than the minors, and but we're still getting the minor in there so we can think about caged in the minor sense as well as the major. So here's the G form, up one fret, up two frets. Up two more frets, but we gotta make it minor. We're losing strings. And then we'll come back down. That's a tough one. We can always break it up. Let's do the bottom four strings. Paco de Lucia has this famous intro to a Bulerias. tell what's happening there? This is an A chord. You can see it, if we play it like this, more clearly recognizable that that's an A chord. Wheeling around like this and using your picky here, that's just the G form of that A chord. And he puts a G natural in there. That's a dominant seventh chord. It's a flat seven over that chord. But learning the cage forms first and then learning the arpeggios after that, that's the subject of another lesson for sure really opens up the fretboard and you can really start to recognize things. And that just means you're gonna learn it more quickly. Sabikas so knew his cage forms, even if he didn't call it by those names. Check this out, what he does in one of his farukas. Now G 
Do you recognize what shape this is? This is the C form, but he's got this note on top, which we can do, just go back to a normal C like this. Put your pinky up on the high G. Well, G is already in the chord, it's just another way of playing it. We can do that when it's open, but when it's barred like this, when we're doing the full C form, we can't, we're out of fingers. But if we just got rid of this and just didn't play that string, we can play this fragment of it and put your pinky on top. You don't even really need to bar it now. This is an E chord, okay? We're just picturing there's our root. So if that's an E chord, he moves up here to A and he uses the open A string, right? Just another way to play an A chord. Then he comes back to E, plays the low E string because that's the root of that chord. Then he moves it up to F and plays A in the bass because A is in an F chord. So he knew that stuff even if he's not calling it by the same names we are. Now if you ever made it all the way through the A section of Leyenda, one of the hardest songs you ever could play, it does this at the end. Now what that is, is nothing but a B major arpeggio and we're traveling way up the neck like this. So this is the G form of B that would connect to the E form. Then here's our D form and then here's our C form. But we're using the B string to get from the G form to the C form like this. Open B, we travel up here and we're playing a fragment of a B chord using the C form and then a high B note harmonic. So that's what I mean by really helping you actually play songs. Like if you practiced your arpeggios, like we didn't talk about those in this lesson, but um, it's absolutely need to know the caged forms first before you do the arpeggios, then this would be something that your fingers already know and they're gonna go right to it when you learn a song like that. Even if you don't understand exactly the music theory behind it, like, well, that was the five chord or that was pushing to this or that, that doesn't matter as much for our purposes here. We're seeing the shape. It's a shape that's familiar to us that we might do in a warm up or something and our fingers go right to it when we learn the song. Okay, so like I was mentioning earlier, we can really work on this stuff without a guitar because a lot of this stuff is as conceptual as it is a technique thing, okay? So you can use blank fretboard diagrams like this. You can make your own, absolutely. I would do that like a long time ago when I'm sitting in an airport or something, just write a um, bunch of, well, not a bunch, six exactly horizontal lines. You got your vertical lines for frets and we, we wanna do more than 12 probably. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna pick an F note right here. Just pick a note any note, but uh, a natural note is good because um, maybe you're more familiar with those notes or something. But um, what I'm gonna do is connect up from here. So I like to start on the left and go this way. Uh, eventually you wanna be able to just pick a note anywhere uh, and then just kind of fan out from there. But I got an F. So if this is on the sixth string, I'm trying to build an F major chord. Forget about minors for now, if this is new to you, an F chord all across the neck, okay? So it's gonna be the E form, because we're on the sixth string and we need to go this direction. We can't go that way because we're out of frets, right? If we were to go this way, that would be the G form territory over there. The E form goes this way when the root's on the sixth string. So we just draw a picture now of the E form. This is the kind of thing that I'm imagining when I'm playing. I can kind of see all those notes and I decide to pluck out just a couple of them and not have my fingers all over all of those, okay? I'm circling what the root is. And if you remember what I said earlier is that whenever you play the E form, the note that your pinky plays here is also the root. And that's our connection point to the D form. So I'm just gonna draw it down here. It looks like an open D, but it's actually an F chord. Whenever you have the D form, this is a harder one um, uh, to connect because we don't have this pivot point like we do in some of the other ones. But every time you play the D form, you have three notes from the C form already there. So these really overlap. Watch this. These three notes connect directly to that C form. So this note is also an F note. I wasn't counting there or whatever. It says if you connect these correctly, that note will be what that note is. Okay, so you can see the D form and the C form overlap so much. Remember that the C form is rooted on the fifth string. Okay, that means the A form is coming up right here. So totally overlapping and connected. That's part of it too. Remember when I played that Sabicus um, tremolo thing? My pinky was on this. Well, we can take our picture from here to know that that note is also could be construed as being part of the C form. Some of these are ambiguous, right? There's a little bit of uh, overlap obviously between them. So you could say that you're kind of in between them sometimes. Sometimes it's up for debate. Are you really in the D form or the C form? Kind of depends on what fingers you're using to play those notes. So wherever you have the A form, these three that line up are the ones we're gonna be barring for the G form, and there it is. This is an F major chord 
all over the neck, connected with our cage shapes. And this is what you should do for every chord you can think of. And you can also do it in your mind, believe it or not. If you can't sleep at night, just picture the fretboard. Pick a, pick a note, pick the name of a chord, and connect it together like this across the neck. That is your crash course on the cage system, a really great way to conceptualize chords on the guitar. And anytime you see anybody doing anything on the guitar, provided that they're in standard tuning, they are inside of one of these five shapes. If you are comfortable with this already and you know your five scale shapes, your five ways of playing the major scale using those cage forms, check out my 12 key scale challenge.